Okay. Um, just to prepare everybody, I'm not much of a public speaker and I'm incredibly nervous. <laughs> so just bear with me. I'll probably read a lot from my notes. Um, but I hope I can just give you a little bit of an insight to what it was like to work in Iraq with Syrian refugees. It won't be a lot of technical information, um, more just from an experience, personal experience pers perspective. Um, so I hope it, it brings a little bit of insight for you anyway. Um, so I think Brian said, my name's Kristen. Um, I need, I think that'll work, yep. So my story um, begins quite a few years ago. In fact, um, it started in my first year of nursing. At the time, I was doing a grad year at the Alfred Hospital here in Melbourne. Uh, when I came across a brochure for MSF, an event that was happening which looked quite interesting, looked a bit different to the usual. I've got to work out how this thing works. This green button. Lovely. So, for those of you who are not so familiar with MSF, they are a medical humanitarian organisation who go around the world helping populations in distress. Uh, most of the people whom we work with are victims of natural or man-made disasters, um, people suffering from epide epidemics, and victims of armed conflict by bringing aid and setting up healthcare programs where people can access what they need. Uh, that's us. <laughs> so in 2014, um, MSF had projects in 63 countries around the world. So at this MSF event, I came across a type of nursing that I had never seen or heard of before. And I was quite impressed that there was such an organisation that existed one that was prepared to go where people needed assistance the most. And without giving it much thought, I was pretty much hooked. Of course, I was still doing my grad year, so the advice I was given was, go get some experience. So I did. I've worked in a number of large cities around the world in tertiary hospitals across probably most areas of nursing. I've worked in rural regional facilities doing emergency care, I've worked in a very rural setting in just a little 10-bed hospital where, as the registered nurse, you're pretty much the only one there to manage whatever walks through the door. I did school nursing for a year in a remote campus um, out in a national park, which was um, definitely not one of the worst places to live in the world. And then I moved to London in England. I went to study a diploma in tropical nursing where in a five-month intensive course, I learned all about what it would be like to work in the mission field. And I loved it. Whilst in London, I did some private home nursing in palliative care. I worked uh, for a time in a sexual health clinic managing people with HIV. And I worked in a phase one quarantine facility researching new developments in influenza. So with all this experience bursting at the seams, I returned back to Australia, applied to MSF, and much to my surprise, I survived the two hour long interview process and was soon headed to Sydney for my induction training. Since joining with MSF, I've been on five missions over the last five years. And I just wanna give you an idea of the vast healthcare needs in the world. So I'll just give you a short run through the different missions that I've been on. This here is um, Malawi. I worked in a small community called Chiradzulu, which is in the south of the country in Africa. And we, I was working in a region um, where HIV was terribly prevalent. I couldn't give you the statistics now, it seemed like such a long time ago, but um, shockingly, shockingly high. My role there was as a PMTCT nurse, which for those who are not familiar, it's preventing mother to child transmission of HIV. The project that I joined was working closely with the Ministry of Health to provide HIV support through training and providing staff to 11 decentralized clinics around the region. 
this is one of the ambulances we used to get to uh, our centres because they were far and wide apart. It could take um, an hour and a half to get to the furthest clinic that we had. And um, unfortunately, there wasn't really a, an ambulance system set up in Malawi. I don't know if you could imagine that, but people walked days and days and days for medical assistance. And often pregnant women would walk to the clinic and lose their babies on the road. Scary picture. <laughs> Um, so next I went to South Sudan, and it was around the time of their first year of independence. Although the project was based only 60 kilometres from the front line, and we did occasionally hear bombing in the distance, it was a safe region where the refugee camp had come and they'd, it birthed itself. Unlike many NGO refugee camps that are built in a grid-like structure, this one was very spread out and very sprawling all over the place. I went in a role to manage an OPD, which is like a walk-in centre, and we were the only primary health care provider for miles around. Um, when I arrived, I think they'd been functioning about six months, and we, had, we started off doing around 4,000 consultations weekly for a population of around 46,000 refugees. They were mostly cases of diarrhoea, uh, respiratory infections, skin infections, and quite a bit of malaria. In my short three-month mission, we managed to open three more medical clinics so that healthcare was accessible for everyone. We recruited a total of 120 new staff from the refugee population. We trained them, we supervised them, and we even managed an emergency measles vaccination campaign in response to measles outbreaks in camps surrounding us. It was super challenging, completely exhausting, almost 24 hours a day, but it was the most rewarding experience. After a few months of rest following this mission, that was when I went on to Iraq to a primary healthcare project working inside another refugee camp, this time with Syrian refugees fleeing the conflict in their homeland. But this story is the one I'll come back to. I've skipped one, I'm sorry. How do I go back? Oh, there we go. Push it harder. Okay, so my fourth mission, um, unfortunately I don't have a lot of pictures from my fourth mission. It was pretty much working inside an office, so this was the team that I worked with. Um, it was one of the most emotionally challenging missions that I had experienced. I was based in Turkey, providing the remote management to a 10-bed referral, MSF referral hospital inside Aleppo, outside of, a, sorry, inside Syria, outside of Aleppo city. Our hospital had to be relocated on two separate occasions because of looting and barrel bombing in the area. The majority of cases that we managed were either chronic conditions, such as diabetes and, and heart disease, with very little medications, um, and trauma victims. So in terms of the referral side, we acted um, as a stabilising centre for, for trauma casualties and then provided a means of medical transfer to Turkey where they would be able to receive further treatment. And finally, my last mission last year, um, a much more uplifting story, I think, uh, was doing search and rescue in the Mediterranean Sea. It was a great holiday. Um, I was based on board this medium-sized vessel at sea for majority of the time, um, searching for overcrowded rubber boats, people who were fleeing conflict, um, persecution, different scenarios from all across Africa and the Middle East, trying to get to Europe for the chance of a better life. That's one of the boats there that after we'd rescued them. They were marked that they'd been rescued and sent back out for military vessels to come around and destroy them. So, as you can see, the healthcare needs in the world are pretty phenomenal. Uh, and these are just a very few examples. 
So back to my third mission um, in Iraq. In 2013, uh, I was called up by the MSF office in Sydney and was asked if I could leave for Iraq in four days. I think actually they asked if I could go in two, but I was in the middle of visiting my sister in Queensland. <laughs> Um, and they needed me to go to manage a, a, measles, a mass measles vaccination campaign in a refugee camp. Um, there'd been a few c cases of measles already diagnosed and we needed to stop it in its tracks before it spread any further. I figured with my experience during the campaign in South Sudan, maybe I'd be in good standing for such a mission. So I repacked my bags, boarded a plane, However, the experience I'd had in the past was nothing to prepare me for the very different cultural experience I was about to have. So after four days of travelling, briefings in Sydney, Geneva, Erbil, which is the capital of Kurdistan in northern Iraq, I finally arrived at my project base in Dohuk, which is here. Duhuk is a town of around 300,000 inhabitants and it's about 60 kilometres from the Syrian and Turkish borders. Dumi's, refu Dumi's refugee camp was located about five kilometres from the town of Duhuk, which meant we had to travel by car every day to and from the camp. Dumi's refugee camp was a melting pot of NGOs each responsible for a different area of management in the camp. UNHCR was there registering people's refugee status and supplying new arrivals with basic shelters, which were pretty much tents, uh, water collection containers and cooking implements. The Department of Health, the Iraqi Department of Health, was managing health checks for visa and work permit applications for new arrivals. And MSF, we were there running the Department of Health built medical centre, providing the primary health care needs for chronic conditions, acute illnesses, again the same, respiratory infections, skin infections, diarrheal illnesses. They also uh, provided services for mental health. As you can imagine, a great deal of trauma was brought with those people. And they were opening a maternal and child health um, activity centre starting with antenatal care when I arrived. There were other, responsi other organisations responsible for managing the water and sanitation, the waste management and, and general camp organisation. So this is what you see at the camp. This is what you see at the camp when you first arrive. So this was my first sighting of the camp. As we arrived in the car, I noticed that each of the dwellings had a metal dish on top of them. I don't know if you can see easily in the pictures, but there's one on the very right-hand side on top of that red roof, very small. And they were, they were over most of the dwellings. It's something I'd never seen before in a refugee setting, so naively I thought it must be some special new technology that comes in refugee camps. Um, but I, I didn't, I, you know, I couldn't identify what they were. So I asked somebody in the car with me, what are these, these metal things? And they said they're satellite dishes. I was like, what do you need a satellite dish for? And I go, for television, what else? <laughs> so I was quite amused because I guess there are just some things in life you can't do without. <laughs> Um, initially, the camp was designed to accommodate approximately 1,000 families. It was built on um, private farming land that I'm not sure how we got a hold of it. I'm sure the government had something to do with that. Um, so it was initially built for just quite a small population, about 5,000 people. Um, at the time of my arrival, the camp had been receiving refugees for around five or six months, and it had already exceeded its capacity by six times. The approximate population when I was there was around 45,000 people. It had, um, it had expanded and, and progressed a little bit in that time, but it was still a very cramped experience. 
So what this meant was that for every tent that was meant to house one family was now housing two and sometimes three. Each latrine that was designed to be shared amongst four tents or four families, which is a bit of a stretch already, was now service, servicing the sanitary needs of around 40 or 50 people. So this is some of um, the makeshift homes because there wasn't always enough supplies to go around. People were arriving all the time. This is an aerial picture of, um, of the camp boundaries of the time, around the time when I was there. The, the, the crisscrossed areas were um, proposed development areas that were still just land when I arrived. They hadn't yet been built up on or given any facilities. The red sections, sorry, the red sections depict the most crowded areas of the camp with approximately 12 square metres of living space per person. So if you think about it, that's around 104 people sharing the space of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So in addition to the cramped living conditions, the camp population had to overcome many other obstacles as well. Access to clean water for drinking, bathing and washing clothes was very limited as there was no mains water supply. Water was actually trucked in on a daily basis to top up these water points, one of these silver things, throughout the camp. And in the wet season, this was near impossible due to the condition of the dirt road. I don't know if many people have travelled to Syria in the days before the conflict, but I've, and I haven't, but I've been told that the general population lived in, in pretty good conditions. They had a really functional, good functional healthcare system. They had great education opportunities with tertiary universities. And they held jobs and they owned land and property. But you can imagine after two years of having a conflict, and this is only two years into the conflict, with a failing healthcare system, many chronic conditions became neglected. And most children born since the conflict began had never had any of the early childhood vaccinations. So you can probably imagine what one case of measles would do in a, in a community like this. So we had to move fast. That's why I had four days to get my act together. So our expatriate team consisted of myself as the vaccination nurse, a logistics coordinator from Switzerland. She's the lovely lady on the left, Valerie. And we had... Um, a medical doctor for technical support who was from Mexico, Ellen, who arrived only in time for the actual campaign. That was due to visa issues when he was trying to enter the country. But of course, we had the support of the, the existing expatriate team that were there already managing the health, other healthcare priorities. So we set our objectives. We needed to reduce the spread of measles in the camp, and we needed to prevent an epidemic. We chose our target population based on the vulnerability of the young children never being vaccinated and based on the case findings which demonstrated some cases were found in individuals over the age of 15, which is not usually common. So we set our target population at six months to 29 years. Obviously, those who being vaccinated in the under nine month period would need to return for, for a booster vaccination in four or five months to ensure they got the best efficacy from the vaccine. Um, so we worked out the percentage of the, of the population in this age bracket, which was about 70%, and this gave us an idea of the number of people that we expected to vaccinate and allowed us to start planning our needs. Fortunately, MSF has a spreadsheet that cheats for you, and all you have to do is put in the population information, and it spits out what you need of all your different supplies. Uh, syringes, needles, rubbish bags, 
sharps containers, everything. The most important, though, is the number of vaccines needed, accounting for a 100% coverage, adding a 15% margin for wastage, and having a 25% backup. So, 71,000 vaccines lying around in a refrigerator is quite a lot. Um, the logistics coordinator with her team was then responsible for all the ordering and gaining supplies and storing everything up until the time of, of, the, vac of the campaign. Um, so then we needed to choose sites. We needed to choose what to do. So we decided to have three different sites dispersed amongst the camp so that people had ease of access to, to the locations. And on, on each site, we had two teams of people. In each team, there were about 19 people. So we had a team leader who was a medically trained person to supervise and to manage any adverse events. We had two vaccinators and four people preparing vaccinations for them, or vaccine. We had two uh, recorders or two people to watch people being vaccinated and tally them so we could keep a progress and, and, and keep data. We had one medication distributor to give vitamin A and albendazole, one MUAC screener for opportunistic monitoring of malnutrition, three registrators filling out vaccination cards to identify age and to provide a patient record, four crowd controllers to maintain control over a large group of people, and one logistics officer just to keep things ticking over. The team leaders were, um, the team leaders, vaccinators and vaccinator assistants were medically qualified and immunisation qualified personnel from within the Department of Health in Iraq. They were wonderful to um, supply to us. And the remaining, the remaining support roles we recruited from within the, the Syrian community. We held group training sessions for each position, emphasising on their role specific task giving a, bra a, a brief understanding of measles and how to assist if there was an adverse event like an anaphylaxis or something. On the day before the campaign, we held a rehearsal session so that all team members could meet together, understand their place on site, and to smooth out any unexpected issues. So this is one of the, the training sessions we had for the medical staff that was held at the Department of Health facilities. The gentleman teaching is actually one of the other doctors we had on site, so he quite kindly came to speak to, to the doctors that were joining our team. So with all the planning and preparation underway, we focused on community awareness. Uh, we were able to utilise 20 members of the existing health promotion team to disseminate the message by word of mouth. They visited the local authorities, religious leaders, community elders, and went tent by, tent by tent speaking to mothers and families. They gave them a basic message about having a vaccination campaign, why, what measles was, what it did, how we can prevent it, and let them know when the campaign was happening. And we spread, we spread posters throughout the camp in public places. And then D-Day arrived. So each of... At each of the sites, we had an expatriate supervisor with communications and, and vehicle to respond to emergencies. It was a little bit of a jumble in the first hour as everybody sort of working out where they needed to be and, and how to work with their space. But after a bit of time of working together and, and me showing them their way around the flow of the place, um, they, and once people started to arrive and started to move through the flow, they really just picked it up. Um, the reports back from the other two sites was much the same, and I had just a profound feeling of, of being proud of all these people, of, of how far we'd come and what we'd achieved so far. The teams were really getting the hang of it, and they were even taking ownership of it. They were encouraging one another, they were telling stories as they worked, and at the end of the day, they were absolutely amazed at reaching a tally of 500 people per team. So that was about 300 people on the first day. I wasn't surprised, that's what we expect. But it was outside of their comfort zone. But now they were really on fire. Uh, 
Uh, we'd planned the campaign to go for five days, but partway through it was brought to my attention that we hadn't really accounted for the population of young men who go off-site at 6am every morning to walk to the main road to get transportation to town to work and earn money. So they were missing all of our campaign days, missing all of our campaign hours. But surprisingly, the staff came up with a solution all of their own. They volunteered that two teams would return on day six, at the, on the rest day of the week, and they'd provide the opportunity for the young men to come and get their vaccine, vaccinations. Now that's, that's a big deal because the vaccinators and the, and the supervisors were actually host population. They were Iraqi people who had homes and families and things to be doing. And to see them change from this is my job to this is where I want to be was absolutely phenomenal. So the vaccination campaign was a success. We vaccinated 19,500 individuals against measles in six days. We actually also vaccinated concurrently, which I didn't tell you about, but against meningitis for the age bracket of two to 29 years. So double that figure. We provided a blanket coverage of vitamin A to protect against eye damage albendazole to treat worm infestations, and we collected valuable data on malnutrition in children under the age of five years to allow for future planning after we had left. I'd say the greatest challenge I faced in the whole mission was the cultural barrier, which was, to put it in a simple way, just a difference in expectations, really. The Iraqi Department of Health medical staff really struggled to catch the vision of a mass vaccination campaign. I, and I struggled to inspire them. <laughs> they were used to doing mo a mobile model of vaccination, going in pairs and doing systematic home visits, and that's how they do their vaccination for everything, even on a mass scale for polio, for example. They visit every home, and they take a number of weeks to do it. And although they voice their concerns for our approach regularly throughout the preparation period, they did agree to try it out on day one, as long as they could review the situation at the end of the day. We agreed on that, and fortunately, we never needed to review anything because on day one, they got it. They got it. So, I guess my take home point today is that. There are desperate healthcare needs all around the world. I beg my pardon. And there is a desperate need for primary healthcare nurses to deliver that care. If you've ever wondered, what could I do to help the plight of the people suffering in our world today? Well, my answer to you is this. You have the knowledge, you have the skills, and I don't doubt you have the heart. At the end of the day, that's all you need. Thank you.